Let's get going here. Um, what I thought I'd do is we'll come back to the notes from yesterday. Um, we definitely have some stuff to do there still, but on the new set of notes that you have, um, what I wanted to do was just quickly get the last section out of the way, right on the fifth page, on the fifth or sixth page, on the very back, just to cover what's in the exam. That way, we've covered it in the class, and uh, we won't run out of time. So, the first thing to note, of course, is that there's uh, several exam practice problems posted for you. As I mentioned in class yesterday, these are the sorts of problems that focus more on the more recent material. We've had seven assignments covering the earlier stuff, but the more recent material, these practice problems will help fill in the gaps for there. Um, solutions will be posted to, to some of them. The exam itself is next week on the 16th of April at 7 at night in IWC2. Please just confirm those details, however. The exam is open notes. You can bring any papers, books, anything you'd like with you in to that exam. You can use any calculator as well. And it will cover everything from the course. Like all my, um, all my exams, they are comprehensive in that they cover everything. So let's just quickly get a brief overview of where we started. We looked right back at the beginning at LPs. And um, there we actually mentioned that we need decrease degrees of freedom, right? There's, if you've got as many equations as you have unknowns, you don't actually have any room to optimize. You need some degrees of freedom to move things around so that you affect an objective function. So there's that. Setting up an LP in standard form, the idea of solving it using simplex method. Now, obviously, I don't mean that you have to be able to implement the simplex method. We didn't cover that in detail. But the idea that it moves from, from vertex to vertex to find the solution, and that your solution will be at the vertex is what I mean by that. So the general concepts in the simplex method are important. Um, interpreting the marginal values and sensitivity analysis comes from the knowledge of the simplex method. We looked at, at the node, what happens if you, if you move the line, the equation for the constraints around how does that affect sensitivity? How does it affect sensitivity when you vary the coefficients in the objective function? Um, that is all given for you, of course, in the computer output. And like you saw in the midterm, you had a chance to interpret that computer output. Um, so we must be comfortable with that. And then the, we ended off that section by looking at LPs from a generic point of view that they can be sort of like allocation problems, bl blending problems, planning problems. And a, a subset of scheduling is actually an LP as well. Then we moved on to unconstrained nonlinear problems. This was even before the midterm. We looked at Newton's method, whether you use it directly with the function values and its derivatives, or if you approximate Newton's method. Then we moved on to steepest descent methods that we head down the direction or up if you're maximizing. And when you, at every iteration, you'll also perform a line search. You fit a quadratic equation to the surface find the optimum of that quadratic, and that becomes the starting point for your next iterate. We looked at convexity and concavity. Those were important because, remember, when we try to optimize and we set the first derivatives equal to 0, we can't guarantee that we're maximized or minimized. So we need to look at the second derivatives. So in one, one dimension, we look at the second derivatives. In two or multiple dimensions, we look at the Hessian. The same information is given by, by both. <coughs> The Nell de Mead method, we didn't actually look at it at that particular moment in the course. We actually looked at it later on. But it fits in the section of unconstrained nonlinear programs, where we are optimizing when we don't have knowledge of the function directly or of its derivatives. So we had a class on that. And then also understand the various difficulties with using these different methods up here. Um, things around convergence, for example, and solving high dimensional nonlinear systems. The constrained nonlinear section, we looked at two approaches. We didn't get a chance to cover the third approach. The first was penalty and Lagrange methods. They're both similar in that they add terms to the objective function. Um, but the one looks at inequalities, the other looks at equalities. GRG is another approach to solving constrained nonlinear problems. I'm not too concerned that we didn't cover it. It builds on very simply from these earlier methods. But to be honest, GRG, as if we just taught it and went through it even with one class, still wouldn't actually cover the true complexity of what GRG does inside the CPLEX solver, for example, or other solvers. So 
it's the sort of topic where either you're going to cover it entirely, sort of at the level of a grad course, or just simply use the solver at this current level where you are. For those of you looking at further work in this area, at the end of the class, I'll point out some paths where optimization could take you in your career. You might want to then investigate that on your own. It's not, not hard, but there's, there's some subtleties there. Then the last five classes or so, we've been looking at mixed integer um, type problems where we're mixing integer variables with continuous variables. We'll see that coming about today. We've seen purely integer problems earlier on. So for example, where you represent something being mutual exclusive or dependent um, on something else, that sort of if else type idea. Um, we've covered that. Then we spent a class looking at the branch and bound algorithm. As I mentioned in that class, uh, there, we will be seeing that in the exam and there's a practice problem or two on that posted already for you to try out. And then scheduling is what we looked at last class and we'll continue it on in today's class. Scheduling is a great topic because it, it, of all the integer type problems, it's the one that you almost certainly come across um, in your career and fairly straightforward to set up and solve. The exam will also, of course, bring all these materials together <coughs> as well as anything that you've seen in tutorials and assignments in the guest lecture are, um, are possible there. So that's the final exam next week. Then the projects which you're working on, there have been some great questions to the TAs and a few to myself and I'm guessing most of you are making progress on that. You're working on your one or two, uh, sorry, two or three case studies that you're looking at in your report. Just on that, the case studies don't have to be elaborate, right? So if you investigate two or three small variations on your base case, whether it's by adding more constraints, by changing the problem from an LP to an NLP or a LP to a mixed integer type problem. Those, you're just doing a comparison there um, in your cases. That's going to be due electronically and I would like you to upload the documents in PDF form or you can point me to a Google Doc link and you need to provide your GAMS code. So because there's this potential for providing me with several little pieces of information, a report, the code, I'm going to have a form where you provide that in a unified way so I don't get 50 emails with different types of styles of submission. So look for that coming and posting, post it on the course website um, before the due date. I'll probably get around to it on Thursday or Friday this week. <coughs> uh, just other final administrative issues are, of course, that all the assignment solutions have been posted as of yesterday. All the grades have been posted mostly. The last assignment grade uh, are still not being uploaded yet to Avenue, but I will, I will get that. The TAs are just finishing up on one more question. So, so that's all, all ready for you to go. Then you'll have all your grades except, of course, the project by the final <coughs> exam. Uh, then also just to wrap up on here, the mid-semester feedback you provided me in paper form helped shape this course and change it a little bit for the last half. Um, based on your feedback. I also will, of course, value your feedback in the course evaluations that you provide. So many of you have done that already, but if you've not, you've got, I think, till 4 o'clock tomorrow. So try to get those in as well. OK. So any, any questions or comments on those administrative issues? OK. So what, let's go back then to where we ended off last class. So this was um, the prior handout. And we were looking at, at scheduling these, these jobs in a reactor. Now, I do have a few spare handouts from yesterday if anyone needs a copy. This, there are some up here. <coughs> so let's just uh, examine what we had there. We said when we're doing this work, we're trying to use the simplest of cases where we've got a single reactor or a single unit that we're scheduling multiple jobs on. So whether they're jobs or products, um, we've got, we introduce this notation of a processing time, uh, P subscript J, and uh, our search variable is the time we start the job. So we start the job, it's got a certain amount of processing time, and then it ends. And as I'd asked you in, in the class on Monday was to look at taking this a step further, which we're going to do now. So what I just want to get up here, however, is 
the visual Gantt chart, which is so important in this topic of scheduling. So what we're looking at is the situation where we've got job three starting at time zero, and its duration is nine hours. <coughs> From time nine hours onwards, we've got job one starting, and it's lasting 15 hours. And then when job one is complete, we start job two in that reactor, and it's got a shorter duration of six hours. Okay, So we can't use the reactor simultaneously. It's either job three or job one or job two. And that was, in fact, where we left the class on Wednesday, was to see how we can try and, and code that up. So if you're wondering where those numbers come from, uh, here they are. Your search variable x subscript j is the start time for the task. So we can write this as, in this particular case, x subscript j equals 3 is equal to 0. Job 3 starts at time 0. It has a processing time pj of 9 hours. So for this particular task, p subscript 3 is 9 hours. Task 1 starts at 9 hours, and it has a duration P1 of 15 hours. And then finally, task 2, XJ2, is equal to, well, if this starts at 0 and goes for 9, 9 plus 15, that this starts at 24 hours, last 6 hours, so P subscript 2 is 6. OK, so what, what we recognize here is that these are my search variables. The solver is going to find values of xj1, xj2, xj3. It's going to adjust those numbers for us left and right according to some criterion. And last class, we, we specified six particular criteria that you might use. Completion time, the average completion time, lateness, tardiness, and so on. So we don't need to go through that because we calculated those last class. And this is where we ended off. And I'd asked you to, to think through this. We said last time that how can we represent to the solver that when job three is running, job one and two cannot run? Or if job one is running, job three and job two cannot run? And there's, I, I derived this in the class. This is a little bit of a weird formula initially. Um, but we ended off the class by subbing in some numbers and seeing that that makes sense. So there it is in English. There it is here mathematically. It simply says that you take the start time of the job plus the processing time. So that's essentially the duration. So if you look at it here, let's look at it for job three. Take the start time of job three is zero. It's nine hours in duration. So 9 on the left-hand side must be smaller than j dash. J dash, uh, xj dash is the start time of later jobs, so job 1 and job 2. So that makes sense. 9 is less than or equal to 9, or 9 is less than or equal to 24. But there's other combinations. So we have to look at all the, all the permutations. So let's, let's just fill this table in. And to help us do that, I'm just going to do it over here. I'll do the first row or two, and then you can, you can try the other remaining rows if you haven't done so already. So let's look at it for j equals 1 and j dash equals 2. So what this says is we've got these three tasks, 1, 2, and 3. So what we're doing is we're going to ensure that 1 does not conflict with 2. And then we're going to set up that 2 does not conflict with 3, and 1 doesn't conflict with 3, and, and look at all the, all the possibilities. So just 1 not conflicting with 2. If you filled in that table there, it says j is equal to 1. So x1, that's 9 hours. The start time there is 9 hours. The duration of job 1 is 15 hours. Must be less than or equal to j, xj-2. xj-2 is 24. So 9 plus 15 is less than 24. That is true, right? So mathematically, that's true. The other column says, or, or the opposite must hold, that x 
j dash. So the start time of job two is 24. Job two lasts six hours, must be less than or equal to xj. Well, xj is x1, x1 is equal to nine hours. Okay, so that, that's obviously not, not true. 24 plus 6 is not less than or equal to 9. But this entire row condition is true. The first part is true, the second part is false, but because this is OR, we only need one of them to work. So overall, this is valid. Okay, let's take a look at the next possibility. Um, so this time J is still equal to 1, but J dash is equal to 3. So in other words, we're looking at this permutation ensuring that task one and three don't conflict. So in that case then, my left hand column here says t is the same because j is equal to one, so still nine plus 15 on the left, but is less than or equal to j dash this time is three, so the start time of job three, x three is zero. So the first column here is not true. Nine plus 15 is not less than zero, but let's hope that the second column is true. The second column is for task j dash, starts at time zero, it lasts nine hours, and it's got to be less than or equal to the start time of task one, j, x, j, so task one starts at time nine hours. So that is true, so again there row two is valid. Okay, so fill in the remaining rows in your table. Actually, what I, maybe just to point out one of the issues, I'll do row two with, uh, row three with you. I want to just emphasize this. So J is equal to two, J dash is equal to one. So notice here what on this representation, here's task one, here's task two, here's task three. We've ensured that one doesn't conflict with two, we've ensured that one doesn't conflict with three. This third row is a redundancy it's going to ensure that task two doesn't conflict with one. So it's just going to take that backwards. So that's redundant because if one doesn't conflict with two already, there's no need to ensure that two doesn't conflict with one. And what you'll notice in it then is you fill out that row in the table, you essentially just write the mirror image of row one. 24 plus six here is less than or equal to nine. Or nine plus 15, is less than or equal to 24. So the, these just switch around. That part is correct, this part is not, not valid, but overall it's still valid. Okay. And what you'll notice then is that your fourth row in the table, uh, J2 and J-3, let's just take a look at that, J equals two, J dash is equal to three. This is a new constraint uh, that we've not seen before. It's ensuring that tasks two and three don't conflict. So we're going from 2 to 3. That's a new side of the triangle we've not explored yet. So that's going to be a unique constraint. OK, so I'll just give you another minute to fill that in. If, unless you've got it already, I'll just write them up here on the board. So this table is critical to understand because in the next set of notes we're going to step this up and add a third subscript, uh, sorry, a second subscript. Right now we're just dealing with two subscripts, sorry, one subscript, xj. We're going to step up the complexity next into another dimension. So the key understanding must hold here though. If you're not sure of what's going on, please make sure that your neighbor next to you can help you out with this.
OK, so not too difficult, simple substitution then. But the, the key thing I want you to notice is we've got double the number of constraints in what we need. Because every time we're, we're, we're doing the reverse of these arrows, we really just need one, one set of arrows. So let me just draw perhaps here next to this. Uh, what we need in practice is if we've got three tasks, task one, two, and three, we really just will do the following. We'll go from the lowered number task to the higher number task. So one to two. We won't go two to one. We go from low to high. So in other words, we're going to ensure that j is less than j dash. That will ensure we don't have redundancies. We go from a lower number to a higher number. One to two. We can do one to three. And we can do two to three. That way, if we have three of these sets of constraints, we've got it all covered. We don't need to do the reverse directions. Okay, So that's written here for you. These rows, rows 1 and 3 are mirror images. Rows 2s and 5s are mirrors. 4 and 6 are mirrors. We can eliminate that redundancy by only writing out the rows where j is less than j dash. Anything unclear up to that point? OK, let's now step this up and take a look at it mathematically. We've got some constraints here, but let's bring in an integer representation to help us here. This is going to be a little bit more efficient. And we're going to do this as follows. Still use the same representation we've used before, xj the start time plus the processing time, less than or equal to xj prime plus big M. So in integer programming, you'll often hear of the big M constraint. This is where the name comes from. We just use the symbol M. We'll derive what M is. It's a number. It's a scalar number. I'll show you how you know what big M should be. 1 minus an integer variable, y subscript j, j prime. Okay, That's going to be the first half of the constraint. The second constraint pair is switched around like we have before, xj prime plus pj prime less than xj plus big M times yj j prime. What is yj j prime? Well, it's, a, it's an indicator, a binary 0 or 1. We say it's equal to 1 if job j occurs before j dash. So that job 1 occurs before 2. Let's see, in this particular schedule, job 1 occurs before job 2. So in this particular schedule, y 1, 2 is equal to 1, because job 1 occurs before job 2. It's 0 if job j dash occurs before j. So you can find uh, then y 1, 3, for example. y 1, j is equal to 1, j dash is equal to 3. So if job 3 occurs before j, then we set that equal to 0. So what our optimizer, when we set, give this to GAMS, is going to solve is now for these continuous x variables, x, j, 1, 2, and 3, and these switching variables that prevent tasks from running simultaneously on the same unit. OK, so let's understand this again mathematically. Um, I'm going to use the same system we've covered here. Task 1 starts at 9, task 2 starts at 24 hours, task 3 starts at 0 hours. Sub in, just literally sub in these particular numbers, write out those constraints, determine if j, yj j prime is a 0 or a 1. To help you, I've written out the job order. Job 3 comes before 1, which becomes before 2. So fill in that table, the six entries there, and leave this last column blank. We'll come to that in a, in a minute. Work with the person next to you. Make sure that you all are in agreement here.
Okay, many of you seem to be getting this, but it's great to see that. So let's just sub in here. The first row should be 9 plus 15 less than or equal to 24 because xj is 9. The processing time for j equals 1, task 1 is 15 hours, is less than or equal to 24 hours, the start time of job 2, plus big M times 1 minus 1. Okay. So task one comes before we're looking at task one and task two. So task one comes before task two, so it's a one minus one. So in fact, this last term just drops away, one minus one. Notice that that, that constraint is still valid. Nine plus 15 is less than 24. Let's look at the, the pair constraint. It says 24 plus six must be less than or equal to 9. This is where we had the constraint last time, up to that point, which is obviously a, a false constraint. But now we're adding plus m, m times 1. Okay. So what value of m do we need to put here to make that constraint true? Math is so hard. 21. 21, OK. OK, let's take a look at the next row. What you should have there is 9 plus 15, again, the same as before, less than or equal to 0, the start time of job 3, plus m times. Now, does job 3 come before job 1? Yes, it does. So job 3 comes before 1. So this is 1 minus 0. OK, so what value of m do we need over here to make this constraint valid? 24. So let's just keep track of that over here. OK. Would a value of 21 have worked? No. So we need a value of 24 or larger. So perhaps we can just emphasize it like this. We need a value greater than or equal to 21 in that first row, a value greater than or equal to 24 in that next row would have still made m work. The second half of row 2 is 0 plus 9 is less than or equal to 9 plus 0. m is equal to z uh, whatever m is multiplied by 0. Then the next row, the final one, is 24 plus 6 less than or equal to 0 plus m1 minus 0 because we're looking at task 2 and 3, and 3 comes before 2. So that the y, our indicator, is a 0 this time. The left-hand side, 0 plus 9, less than or equal to 24 plus 0. So that constraint works, or the second constraint works. The first constraint w requires which value of m? Greater than or equal to 30. OK. So the value we will use here for big M is a value of at least 30. If you're naive, you just go put into GAMS 1 million, right? But you can, it actually creates a problem by doing that. Right? You can actually create a very poorly conditioned problem that's not solvable. So you want to pick M as low as you can, but it's still valid for all possible constraints. The rule is that you can use is simply total up all the processing times, right? Because you're running all these products back to back to back, so 9 hours plus 15 hours plus 6 hours, you know that capital M must at least be 30 or larger. That will ensure that all six of these constraints are valid. And that's essentially, that's the scheduling problem, right? We've got our objective function that we covered in last class. We've got these conflict avoidance constraints here that we've just derived. And we can go solve this in GAMS. So let's, um, let's just take a look at that here. There's really, um, there's some interesting stuff here in the code for those of you that have, are interested in GAMS. Um, I think Devin had asked in one class earlier how you can sum up under certain constraints. So you only sum certain indexes, and that's, there's some of that is given over here. Um, this is, I don't really need you to understand what's going on here, other than to recognize 
that there's the constraints we've just been considering. X plus processing time is equal to X plus an M value. Okay. And we call those disjunctive constraints because they're either or. Disjunctive is an English word that means one option or the other option. So these are disjunctive constraints that ensure that one or the other holds. And it's just a really compact way of coding up all those constraints there. If you solve this in GAMS, you get an optimum that task one starts at 15 hours, task two starts at nine hours, and task three starts at zero. Let's just visualize that. This is, this is the important part. Task three starts at zero hours. That's currently where we are. But what GAMS has gone and said is that task one will start at 15 hours and task two will start at nine hours. So GAMS has essentially put the jobs one and two switched around. So job two will be six and job one is 15 hours. Okay, So it's still a total processing time of 30. You got nine plus six plus 15, it gets you 30. There. It's just flipped the order around. Not a very inspiring use of, of integer programming for something that you could have just figured out in your, he in your head. But let's uh, step it up quickly. So this is the second handout that you have. of all the processing times. Yeah. OK, so we're going to take this problem just a, a, a tiny step further. Yes, Mark? Sorry, I just wondered, what was the point of finding the M instead of just adding up all the process time? Just to emphasize that when m for the first constraint has to be greater than 21, 24, 30, if you use 30, all these other prior constraints are valid. Okay, I just don't want to just say use m, the processing times, if you don't know where it comes from. Right? So we don't want to just apply stuff without understanding what we're doing. So let's, uh, let's make a, take a realistic problem here. We've got a mixer, reactor, separator, and packaging unit. And we're producing three products, a, b, and c on four units. And there's their processing times for each of the products. So product A, of course, requires the mixer for an hour, then the reactor, then the separator, and then the packaging line. What I want to just build up here in the next few minutes is the way that we write this problem in GANs. We've already got our objective function from the prior class. You can minimize lateness. You can minimize tardiness. But what we need to understand is setting up what we call precedence constraints. This is the new part, right? Because you've got to mix for product A before you react. You can't react and then mix. So this is the new section. That's all that's really new. Nothing else really changes. Other than instead of having one unit, now we've got four units. But we need constraints in there to ensure that the precedence is handled correctly. So let's just take a look at that. Perhaps let me ask you, how would you code up this precedence constraint? And to do that, I'll show you some new notation that we're going to use. Now, instead of just having, we had xj in the, in the prior section, we now add a new subscript, xj comma k. So J is still for tasks or products. So J, in this case, is equal to A, B, C. But K is now the unit. K is reactor, mixer, separator, packaging. Okay. So the problem when you've got sequences of units, you now not only need to start your job, but you need to ensure that you sequence them in the correct order. So there's your new notation, x, j, k. All that's new is the k subscript. And the precedence constraints are fairly straightforward. And they're not even integer. They're just regular linear constraints. So let's take a look. For example, the most complex one is 
product A. So for product A, we have to have 1 going to 2, going to 3, going to 4. When we write out precedence constraints, the precedence constraints are simply written on the arrow parts. So you need a precedent constraint for 1 going to 2, 2 going to 3, and 3 going to 4. So let me illustrate that here. To ensure that A is processed in the mixer first, before it goes into the reactor. So A is going to be in the mixer for an hour, and then it goes to the reactor for five hours. We'll simply write it as follows. XA in the mixer, the mixer is 1. Two will be the reactor, and so forth. So A is in the mixer for one hour. Must be less than or equal to A going to the reactor. The start time of A on the reactor. So just in English, then, that's the start time of A on the reactor, and this is the start time of A in the mixer. OK, so I said one constraint per arrow. So 1 to 2 we've done. Let's do 2 to 3. Well, that's very similar. x A in the reactor plus the reaction duration of 5 hours must be less than or equal to x A 3. And then the final arrow is x A in step 3 plus the duration in the third unit, the separator, must be less than x A 4. Okay, so three constraints for three arrows for product A. Product B, what is product B's equation? Okay, plus four and a half must be less than or equal to xb4. We don't have a constraint for b going one to two or two to three because product b doesn't use the mixer or, sep or the reactor. Okay, and then you can write out product c in, in the same way. Product c is a little bit interesting because it reverses the order of use. So perhaps let me write out for product c. Product C goes from the third unit, and in the third unit, the separator, it's used for five hours. And then it actually goes to the second unit, so XC2. So it's just backwards for product C. But the key thing I want you to notice is there's no rules to this. Just follow the arrows. Three goes into two, and then step two for product C goes into step Four. Where are the lists of order? Where are the lists of? Oh, sorry. I asked where the list of the orders were. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six constraints for this particular set of products being produced on these on this reactor. OK, now what gets visually a little bit messy is we extend what we've just learned prior, where we're now requiring that one reactor, for example, can't process both product A and B simultaneously. We, we step this up, and we now just get an extra subscript. So instead of J and J prime, we also have the K subscript for K unit 1, K unit 2, K unit 3, K unit 4. OK, so what we can see then, of course, is that the mixer has no conflict constraints. The mixer visually 
you can always use it for product A. It's never competing, the mixer is never being competing for product B or product C. The reactor only competes for product A and for product C. The separator and the packaging line compete for all three products. So what I've done there for you is written out those constraints for the separator. That's the worst case situation. It's, it really, it looks more messy than it is. It's just a straightforward use of these equations substituting in the correct values for j, j prime, and k. So not too much there, the same principle as what we saw before. And the GAMS code for this is given here. The setting up of this, again, is really not the critical part of the, the course, though I will say for the few of you that are interested in advanced GAMS, there's a lot of interesting complex use of the GAMS language in here, as you can see with all of this mess down here. It's just essentially using two lines of code to code up all those constraints over all subscripts j, j prime, and k. But what is worth investigating is the output. And this is where I'd like you to spend the next few minutes and in interpreting this output. The output simply asks or tells us what the order of A, B, and C products are on <coughs> reactors, separators, mixers, and packaging lines. So one, two, three, four. Remember, these are your search variables. These are the start times of the product on the unit. And they have this notation j.k. So product dot unit. So A on one, A on two, A on three, A on unit four. So what I'd like you to do is take that output and then draw what this GAN, GANS chart would look like. This is the optimal GAN chart that minimizes completion time. If we had a few minutes, what I would have actually asked you to do is to just look at that schedule over there and ask you to come up with your own intuition of what the GAN chart, the optimal GAN chart would be. Right? We, we just don't have so, many, so much time left. So it's actually what you might set up initially just looking at this table and the separator is what every operator and engineer does in practice. But solving it actually leads to a slightly more efficient solution that you may not have necessarily anticipated. So let's take that output over there and reconstruct the optimal GAN chart that minimizes completion time. So I'll let you start with that and in a few minutes I'll draw up my version on the board and see if it agrees with yours. Yeah, so what you'll do is in this table just block off, like just use little squares to show like, for example, if A is in this block, just write an A in there, a B, a C, a D. A, B, and C, sorry. So just say the mixer is used from time 0 to time 1 for A. In fact, that is what the very first one is. A on unit 1 starts at time 0, the dots 0 in GAMS. So that first square right in the top left is just as, is, you just write an A in over there.
Okay, so product A starts up in the first unit for at time zero. Product A's duration in that first unit is also one hour. We know that information. The PJ, the processing time for product A in unit one is one hour. This next entry here says A in unit two, in other words, the um, reactor starts at time one. And we know that A needs five hours in the reactor, so A, A, A needs five hours there. Okay, you can use shading, you can just write the letters in however you prefer to denote this. Let's just finish up the schedule for A. It's interesting that the next step, the uh, separator doesn't start back to back. The separator starts at nine and a half hours in for A. So nine and a half hours in for A and we need four, uh, four hours on the separator. So one, two, three. Okay, so there's actually a gap in the production of A where A is just sitting. Then finally, uh, A is used in the packaging line, starts at 13 and a half. We package A right at the end of the schedule. Okay, if you fill in C and B, so I'll just fill those in. C starts off the schedule. So what's great with this visualization is you get to see where the bottlenecks are in the process. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, so you should get a schedule that looks uh, something like that. The only one I've listed off is B starts at. How do you know that? Um, you know, um, so just like the difference between like C one and A. So C is product C, A is product A, and they're in the unit first unit. So in the in the mixer, right? I mean, like. C1 has a value of zero, but we're not putting it in our Gantt chart. But A1 has a value of zero also. Yeah, That's so. Just because we know that C isn't going to C doesn't get used in the mixer, so the default value is zero. Yeah. Right, so we know C is not involved in the, in the schedule. Yeah. I know C is structured at 3.5, but how do you know it ends at 12? Oh, sorry, where does it end? Uh, sorry, how long is the duration of C in packaging? Yeah. How long is it? Okay, sorry, I just, okay. So this is the optimal schedule for minimum completion time. And the, the reason why I just wanted you to go with this is because to emphasize two things. Firstly, representing the results this way is not user friendly. And as the engineer, you would never give this to your colleagues to work from. You would need to take this and move it into a Gantt chart to, produ to produce a schedule. The second point I wanted to emphasize and the final point I wanted to emphasize was the marginal values. The marginal values here for integer variables are not interpretable in the same way as regular LPs. So LPs marginal values tell you how much you, your uh, constraints are sensitive to the value in, in the coefficient. For integer variables, because they jump from 0 to 1, we can't interpret them in that, in that integer problem in the same way. So we disregard the marginal values in integer problems for integer variables. So, so that's really the extent of the output from GAMS that I wanted to cover here. Any final questions on this particular problem? Yeah, yeah, so I know we've run a little bit over time. 
So the rest of the slides, uh, sorry, the rest of the material in there is just for, for enrichment. Uh, please feel free to go on it afterwards.